Hi, welcome to Leaving the Lies and Speaking Your Truth. Thank you for joining us today on this episode. I would like to remind you to like, share, and subscribe to our YouTube page and head on over to Facebook and also um, join our page, Leaving the Lies and Speaking Your Truth. The more people we reach, the more help that we can give and the more awareness we can make people aware of being a part of cults and knowing that there is life outside of those places. I'd like to thank my co my co-host today, Melody, for joining me. How are Hi, you, hon. Mel? I'm good. How are you, hon? I'm I'm doing it, Mel. I'm doing it. Hanging in there. <laughs> I am. And I would especially like to welcome our very special guest today. Evan Jones. Evan, thank you for coming on here with us today. We have many things to talk to you about, but one thing that I'm especially excited to speak about because you, you, my dear sir, are actually a fighter and you are on the front lines. So if we could go ahead and get started today, Mel? Okay, we're going to start out really simple. Can you tell us how long, you, actually your cult was the um, Independent Fundamentalist Baptist, and you're not the first person that we've interviewed from that group, um, but can you tell us how long you were a part of that group? Well, I was born into the group, so uh, 23 years. Wow. Wow, right out the gate, you were just born into it. <laughs> yep. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was a uh, second generation, my parents joined the group whenever um, they were teenagers. Well, my mom was a teenager. My dad joined when he was in college. And uh, yeah, that was all I knew for the first 23 years of my life. Wow. Wow. So while we're going along in this interview, I would like for people to realize and remember, for those of you that might be scared to leave the situation that you're in, this, this person right here, was knew nothing different but this group and these core sets of belief and it is how his parents essentially grew up also so please keep this in mind um evan what was it like growing up as a member of the ifb um i mean it, it, it was all that i knew so there was definitely th things that were familiar i didn't realize the links or the extremes of the abuse until much later, until I left, which I think a lot of people are like. We had a lot of rules, obviously, um, very strict dress standards. We um, Everything in our community was run by our church, which is part of the reason why it's been classified as a cult, because, you know, they ran their own school system. So I attended their school system. They had their own colleges. They had their own, you know, all their activities. So from the, the time I woke up in the morning to the time I went to bed, I was doing something that was connected to the church or was connected to the IFB movement. And that was seven days a week, you know, school during the week. In the evening, there were church activities. On weekends, we went what we called soul winning, but, you know, other groups would call recruitment, um, witnessing. And so we would do that all day on Saturdays to get people to come to church. And then Sundays, of course, all day long you would have church services sunday schools other activities that they would have for you and so i mean it, it, that was my community every person i knew was a part of this community everything that i knew was taught from the perspective of this community so while it's easy to look back now and see how abusive and toxic things were i mean it that was my home so right I, you know even though there were things I didn't agree with at times, I didn't know any better. I didn't know to question. I didn't know what there could be. Right. Absolutely. Right. And, I, oh, and go ahead. Add on to that, that you were literally immersed in it. It yeah. was your whole existence. Did you guys have TVs? Did you go to the movies? Did you do anything like that? Well, we weren't allowed to go to the movies. They were very strict on like outside things, such as going to the movies, listening to the radio, we made our own music. The TV thing was kind of a split issue. Like there was the, the, the independent fundamental Baptist movement is a, it's a group of a bunch of churches that all claim to be independent, but they're really connected. But the, the pastors are the individual overseers. So, whereas you don't answer to one particular um, head of the whole movement, the pastors are the heads of their churches, but they all follow a couple of what I like to call the godfathers. So the godfathers, mm -hmm would kind of be control of their section. So our godfather, who happened to be my pastor, was a man named Jack Hiles. And 
Hiles was kind of split on the TV, so mostly we just watched, we could watch things where, that were from 1930 to 1950. It was just that he had picked mm. that that was the good decade. And mm. then we didn't watch anything after that. So, yes, I did have a TV. I did watch some TV, but it was very limited. And they were constantly, you know, speaking out against television. They called Hollywood, Hollywood, all those kinds of things. Oh, okay. So it was limited and controlled. Yes. Um, so very controlled. And I want to back up and ask uh, another question. Um when you speak about the abuse that, that happened inside the organization, was that multiple different kinds of abuse? Was it physical abuse, mental abuse, emotional abuse, sexual abuse, all of the abuse? Yeah, I mean, well, there was a lot of physical abuse. That was kind of a hallmark, um, especially child abuse. But there was, I mean, it was kind of expected that you would, you know, you would spank children is what they called it. But they were very graphic and laying out how you should hit children and they would use oh. you know the verses in the bible that talk about the blueness of the wound and how you have to make wow. sure that you hit a child until they're black and blue till they're bleeding and there was a lot of there was books written on that so um and in fact actually a few years ago i think in 2011 there was a it was a big news story because there was a there's a a couple called uh, michael and debbie pearl who wrote a book called to train up a child which was actually very similar to a book that Jack Hiles had written in the 70s, but they they wrote a little bit more recent one in the 90s. And they ended up being taken to court because a child was chained up outside and beaten and they, they ended up dying. And it kind of put, showed a spotlight on that. So they were very particular about abuse. They believed that, you know, you should start hitting kids when they're an infant and you should hit them all the way until they leave at age 18 or until they, you know, they cross over into that adulthood. Um, so that I would think I would say that was the biggest thing, and then there was physical abuse with women, but that was very much covered up. Mm -hmm. It was kind of like okay, you shouldn't beat your wife too much, but there was no. Even though they talked about how you shouldn't beat your wife, there were plenty of women who were being beaten, and they were being forced to stay with their husbands, even though their husbands were abusive. Wow. Um, and then of course you had a lot of mental, emotional, psychological abuse. There was a lot of sexual abuse, and that was covered up a lot. So. You know, the, yep. the Jack Hiles, his son was notorious for abusing several teenage girls. Um, there was there was just a lot of stories of sexual abuse that have not started to come to light until very recently. A few years ago, wow. a reporter started shedding a light on the sexual abuse in the IFB and she found over 800 cases yes. and many of them were all linked together. So um, there was a lot of that going on. But of course, it was very hush hush. Yes. Right. I, I encourage those that are watching to look up Jack Hiles because Evan is not the first one. We did one with Ivy and I, I'm the Google queen of the two of us. Mel is the tech queen. I'm the Google queen. I got to know. But the, the more that I dove into it, it was almost like being in a rabbit hole. And the more my heart actually broke, um, knowing as children what you went through. Oh, yeah. Um, I, I really encourage people to look this up so that when you are listening to Evan speak today, you realize that he's not just telling a story. He's telling a story of survival and oh, yeah. what a warrior that he is. Um, well, and I I'm just going to say, too, that I love that you're bringing to light because we've talked about this on other episodes, but I, I can't I can't emphasize enough about how. It seems to be so prevalent that these groups and these cults actually will not only breed abuse, but they support it. They hide it. They cultivate it. They encourage it. It's it, to the point where that's one of the things that we definitely have worked on trying to bring that to light to show. Because honestly, to me, obviously, you know, I don't want to see anybody being abused, but children are the ultimate of they're, they're innocent victims, and they certainly have nobody that's, especially ones that are born into a group like this, have nowhere to go. They don't have resources. Where are they going to go? Who are they going to tell? Everyone they know is part of the group. So they have no outside. If they tell anybody, it's probably only going internally to the group, and it's probably being met with a brick wall. Oh, absolutely. I mean, 
there was cases where kids did try to go and they tried to report their parents or they tried to tell others. I mean, but again, like you said, who are you going to report to? Because you're going to report every leader in your life is tied to the church. You go to the right. school run by the church. You you go to Sunday school run, every mentor you have. And then in cases where kids did try to get, you know, to report their parents, they were labeled as troublemakers. And these kids were then sent off to these horrible teen homes in the teen home industry, which is starting to come to light. And the abuse there was even more aggressive. So you really didn't have a place to go. And if you did speak out, it was going to get much worse for you. So you just buckled down and and took the abuse. Wow. Wow. So uh, you already mentioned that the leader of your group was Jack Hiles. Um, And can you explain a little bit about how the leader was treated within the congregation and how that differs from more mainstream type religions? Yeah. I I mean, Hiles was definitely worshiped. And of course he would say that he wasn't, I mean, every good leader knows the right things to say. They know how to say that it's not about them. It's about God. And they're, you know, God's just using them as a vessel or whatever word they want to use. But you could tell, I mean, from the things that Hiles did. So you would, like we would have these things um, when I was a teenager and every Saturday before we would go out witnessing for the church, we would go to his office and we would stand around his office and we would sing this song called, we love you preacher. And we would, we would clap hands and we would sing until he would finally come out. And then we'd go into the office and we'd talk to him and we'd fawn over him. You know, everybody, we knew his favorite treats, which was a Reese's. We'd bring him Reese's. We'd bring him diet Dr. Pepper. That was his favorite drink. And then, of course, I mean, people in the church, he taught that if you want to show God that you love him, show God's man that you love him. So like by honoring God's man, you're honoring God. And I think, you know, we see this in a lot of different cults where like that's why you saw people sign over their homes to their leaders. They sign over their cars. They sign over their paychecks because they're trying to prove God to God that they love God. And they're entrusting it to the leader who then just takes it for themselves. So. Hiles had, according to his daughter, who later would come out and she would speak out against him, um, had a, a several million in the bank. He was very comfortable. He was very well off. And he had his 40th anniversary. We all pitched in and we bought him and his wife brand new classic cars. We sent them on this huge um, trip. We gave them a check. I think it was for a hundred or $150,000. Just gave them a check just because. Um, and those were regular things that we did. And even after he died, what we would do is his, his, the anniversary of his death was February 6th. And every February 6th, we would have a big celebration where we honored him. And um, we had, our church had taken, so he was uh, actually from Texas. I think he was in Abilene for a little bit. Um, wow. He, we, they took his first church and they dismantled the church and they brought it from Texas up to Indiana several hundred miles away and they rebuilt the church. They also bought the first home he ever lived in as a child. They dismantled it. They brought it up to Indiana and they rebuilt that. And so we would go in there. We would sit in his church. We would walk through his home. We would touch his things that he has as a child. Autumn, is this, is this ringing any bells for you? You you see, I'm, I'm, I'm triggering a little bit. Go ahead, Evan. (sighs) And then we would, and we would eat his favorite meal, which was a Whopper Jr. with cheese, minus mayonnaise, plus mustard, hold the pickle. And we would eat his favorite meals, eat his favorite foods. And that, I mean, I left 10 years after his death and they were still doing that. Wow. And to my knowledge, they did it. They continued it for several more years. They may still do it. I don't know. But, um, but yeah, I mean, those, so you can't say that that's not a worship of an individual when you have that extreme, like the fact that I know this man's favorite fast food meal 10 years after I've left Right. shows how that's ingrained in you and shows how you're you're conditioned to reverence these people. Oh, definitely. That's I mean, that's something that's actually happened fairly more recently in our cult where they're actually building what I would call a shrine to our mm-hmm. leader of his old childhood home like a replica of it and no, I No, they they have gone back to Oklahoma and gotten some of the stuff. That's why when Evan started saying that, I mean, I just started flashing. Yeah. It's just like, wow. <laughs> well, you, wow. Guys, you guys were about 20 years behind us because I think you were founded around 1980, 1984, something like mm-hmm. that. So yep. Miles, he had been a, a pastor for a while in Texas, and then he got called up to Hammond. You know, there was a wealthy church in Hammond that wanted a, a pastor. Mm. So he went up there in the 1960s. And so, and then the worship of him really started around the late 80s, early 90s. Wow. 
You know, and it and it's funny not to to run off subject, but I'm going to for just a moment, Mel. You know, I I guarantee Yishro knew this this man Jack Hiles, oh, whether I... literally knew him or studied him, and because, and I'm also going to say this, Yishro spoke to David Koresh because he yep. wanted to know how to do multiple marriage. Yep. Because we started the multiple marriage months, months, Melody. Oh yeah. After the whole thing went down. Yeah. So I'm. It's almost like they have a con. They have like what is that thing? Uh, where you go convention. Yeah. It's a cult leader convention they go to. It's a secret convention none of us know about, <laughs> yeah, where they discuss right. ways to deceive people and get their money. <laughs> Well, they definitely, there's definitely, they, there's, I believe it, these, the head leaders all admire other cult leaders, even though they know mm -hmm. better than to say things like that. They admire them. They, they look to them. I mean, Jack Hiles was famous um, about three years after Jim Jones. So that was, you know, down in um, yep. uh, South America where people drank the Cyanide Aid, Kool-Aid yep. and died. He did a sermon where he talked about how anybody in his um, in his close confidence would drink poison for him. And he actually brought up one of his men onto the stage. And, and there's still a clip of it where he said, if I told you to drink this poison right now, would you? And it was, it was notorious for that. But I mean, this is uh, just a few years after this made headlines, over 900 people died in that massacre. Right. And so it just shows like they have this admiration for each other, even though they know, you know, they're smart enough to know how to present that to their public, but they clearly right. study each other. Oh no, I, I we see it we see it more often than I'd like to admit because there's just so many similarities that it's mind-boggling when you hear more of it you're just like no way. No way, that's too much of a coincidence. It's weird. And I, I want to add something to those that are watching. Um <clears throat> because I've been asked by several different people. Well, I mean, you've heard about these enough taking place, why would you join it now? It's not like that. It's not like that. That the, people don't go in going thinking, oh, that's like Jim Jones, or that's like David Koresh, or that's like this. No, no, let me make this very clear to, to you guys right now. I would venture to say 90% of the people that go in are searching for something and they're given this much of the truth. And what M Mel has explained to me, and Evan, I'm sure you know this, love bombed. Yep. You're finally wanted. And, and we can all three sit here and admit, I, I, I do believe that in this day and age, I mean, there is so much hate that if you find somebody give you a piece of love, you're, you're going to get sucked into it. And the next thing you know, that's your, that's your life yeah. and you don't see a way out. So let me explain that right now before anybody listens any further, because this story, I don't want to say it gets better, but it gets to the point where by the time this ends, you're going to be looking at Evan going, wow. Wow. Um, okay, so my question was, and my question was answered, um, what were some of the negative uh, effects that the organization had on you growing up? Did it have any residual effects on you being mentally, emotionally, physically abused? I mean, yeah, I, I definitely st um, struggled a lot when I left. I, I think that I initially, because... In these communities, the one thing about a cult is they know how to build community, whether they do it a healthy way or not. And right. I think that a lot of people struggle with that. So not, I, I had no one when I was out and I didn't know how to interact in the real world. So like, you know, a lot of people, I turned to what I had available to me. So I turned to drugs. I turned to alcohol. That's mm. how I coped for several years. And I, you know, I didn't go to therapy. I didn't reach out. And I, and part of that was my own fear because, you know, they had railed hard against psychologists and psychology and they told us not to trust those people. And part of it was I was tired of looking at people and telling them my story. And then, mm. and at that time, you know, now I'm more comfortable, but at that time, them being like, like they, they didn't know what to do with that. You know, it's very hard to find a cult trained therapist. And, yeah. um, I, so I struggled with that, you know, and I kept going to therapists that just seemed too overwhelmed by my story. And so I just stopped. Um, and yeah, I struggled with all those things. I struggled um, big with suicide, um, suicidal thoughts. I, you know, I was drowning in my, my alcoholism and I was ready to just end it all. I mean, it didn't seem like there was any hope, like this is what I'm just left with. And 
thankfully, you know, I decided to try once again to get sober and I was able to find some people that helped me. And I think actually for me, my sober community for a while, it was the first time in years that I had had any kind of community. And these people just kind of rallied around me and being able to go to some place and have people be around me again started to help me, you know, open my eyes and put my life back together. And, and from there, I was able to build more support systems. But like a lot of people, I struggled with all of that nightmares. I mean, and to this day, I just a couple of days ago, I had another nightmare. Mm. And um, it know, may I have been struggled. triggering that you were doing the interview that triggers people because yes, they know they're going to yes. talk about it. Exactly. So I, I still struggle, but I don't struggle like I used to. But yes, all, all those things are there. I was diagnosed officially with PTSD. And um, and that's the reality of most people that come from these environments. Wow. We are in the same club, Evan. Oh, yeah. No, and some of the I, stuff, some of the stuff he was saying, I know you have specifically said on other episodes, I was thinking, oh, Autumn's relating to this. <laughs> yeah. I mean, at five, five years ago, I finally finally five years ago i was able to sit across from somebody blurt my whole story out and they had no reaction at all mm -hmm. they were just like okay, okay. Yeah. this is what you have and do you know how great it felt to be told this is what the deal is and this is how we're going to help you you know so, so. validating it's so validating to get yes. that you know because they, they constantly try to invalidate you they constantly try to tell you that you're bitter and you're just not forgiving and you you know you're blowing it out of proportion and it gets in your head and you need a professional to look at you and say no what happened to you was wrong yeah. and it's okay that you're hurt and we, let's try to work through some of it absolutely yes. absolutely and this is the thing i hated the most <laughs> I'm so sorry that you went through that. Honey, I don't need you to be sorry. <laughs> I just need you to tell me I'm okay. Right? Or that I'm going to be okay. At least. <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, yes. We know that you spent time in what you call the Reformers Unanimous part of the organization. Can you explain to us why you had to go into that part of the organization and what that experience was like for you? Yeah. So, um... So Reformers Unanimous is the fundamentalist rehab, and they just, they treat everything with the Bible. They give you their own program that they, they do. And I see it more as a way to keep people in line once they're adults. So like I said, you know, when you're a child, they have their physical abuse and anybody can, can hit you. They sign off on these corporal punishment forms. So like your, your principal, your teacher, your camp counselor could hit you. And, and then if you were really bad, you would go to one of their, their troubled teen homes, many of which have shut down and some of them have moved around. But then you become an adult and you can't hit the adults, um, at least not often. And so there's not, for people who are rebelling, but they still want to keep a hold of them, they send them to their rehabs and Reformers Unanimous is one of their most common and famous ones. Um, Josh Duggar from that show, um, a, I don't know what 19 kids and counting, yes. whatever the Duggar clan, he actually went to one of those for his sex addiction. So mm. when I was 14 was the first time that I realized I was attracted to girls. I'm a transgender man. So that means that I was assigned female at birth and I was raised as a female in the, um, in the IFB. I did not know, I didn't have the terminology to define myself. I didn't think that trans people existed or if they did, they were just locked in asylums. I didn't think that was an option for me. But I did know that I was attracted to girls. That was pretty obvious to me early on. I was terrified of it. And I kept it quiet for many years. And then whenever I was a senior in college, so I was going to college run by the cult, Hiles Anderson. Mm. And when I was a senior in college, I had a breakdown. I was working for the college. I was attending college. Every single thing in my life was still completely wrapped up in the church. And I had a breakdown. And um, I got expelled with like a semester left. And I confided in someone that I, I had, I had just, just started drinking, which was a huge no in, at all. You couldn't have any kind of alcohol. And I, I had started drinking and I confided in someone that I thought I was drinking because I was attracted to girls. And so mm -hmm. they sent me to Reformers Unanimous. And I spent six months in this rehab, which was just every minute of your day is controlled. Um, it's in some ways it's like a traditional rehab in that you know if you're if you're inpatient and you're supposed to stay on site but in other ways it's very much not 
ironically for me at least it was kind of a relief because i didn't have the strenuous demands placed on me that i did when i was regularly interacting in the church right. so in that response in that respect i i don't feel like i suffered like other people but that would be considered a form of conversion therapy because basically they were trying to treat my sexual addiction and that's what they would anything that was LGBTQ, anything that was, if you were, if you had an affair, if you were masturbating too much, that would all, if you got caught watching porn, that would automatically be put as a sexual addiction. And that was treated with a bunch of other addictions. And basically it was just to keep people from rebelling. I mean, there were girls there who were just depressed. There was a girl there who had been making out with her boyfriend and she didn't want to break up with her boyfriend so they sent her to the home there were also people there that had hard drug convictions and they had hard um they had serious substance abuse problems there was a this this mix of people that really did need help and people who were obviously there because they were rebelling and they could control them right so <clears throat> question and, and this <clears throat> I'm, I'm gonna use quotes okay right. uh, rehab um, so if you were a hardcore drug addict or actually truly did have a, a, a sex addiction, um, you were mixed in with people that were just depressed like you yeah. that were just that were depressed, that were defiant. I mean, you're 23 years old and they're telling you, you can't date someone. So they send you to rehab. Like right. that was how, yeah, it was very much like that. Like there was this huge mix of people. So there, so you're placing somebody like you, I'm just gonna call you normal, cause you're normal, okay? Mm -hmm. Normal thoughts. And I'm placing you in a room with somebody who could be raping or molesting people because you're in rehab. They're putting normal people in, in more danger than basically. Am I, am, I, am I getting this correct? I think in some sentences, yes. I, I, I think that they put a lot of very sick people in with a lot of people that just needed freedom. I also do think that they put people that were child molesters in a, an attempt to hide them, put them in this rehab. So rather than reporting you to the police, I'm going to put you in rehab for your sex addiction. So that's where a lot of things overlapped. I mean, someone who struggles with, you know, with substance abuse, they need intensive counseling. They need Absolutely. help. Um, and, but they're very sick and you, all you're doing is having them copy Bible verses all day. That's not going to help them. Right. And, you know, that's why they don't have a high success rate, though. They do lie and say they have a high success rate. They don't actually follow up with anybody to see it. Anybody who completes their pro their program is considered cured. So they mm. count that as a success rate. Meaning they're not going back a year later saying, are you still drinking? Are you exactly. still having your issues? They're not checking up on anyone. Exactly. So there's no way to verify that. And of course, a lot of people graduate from their programs. That's it's easy. You've got those people controlled, but right. that doesn't mean that there's any follow through. I started drinking two weeks after I left. So, I mean, and then, and I, uh, so graduating means you followed <laughs> enough of the protocol so that they exactly. could say you, you followed the rules enough. So they said, okay, you can go now. Bye bye. Exactly. You graduated. Yeah. And then I, you know, and then it was, it was, um, well, five months after that, that I came out the first mm. time. Okay. But let me make something very clear here, though, Evan. Okay, Mel, I'm pulling out my soapbox. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> Evan, you had a drinking problem. You you outright admit that. You used yeah. it as a crutch. Yeah. That, that honey, and I'm from the South, so please don't get offended, but that honey was your only addiction. Anything else they may have put you in there for, it was not an addiction, was not wrong, okay? I'm sure now you know that, but I'm telling your inner child that. <laughs> what they put you in there for, there was nothing wrong with that. Thank you. That's the mom in me. <laughs> That's all I'm gonna say. Okay. I didn't realize I was gonna get this riled up. Okay. <laughs> so you you sounded like you were gonna maybe fall asleep. <laughs> <laughs> you know, at the beginning I thought, man, I gotta pull through this, but now I'm like <laughs> my soapbox Evan you just sit there and let me tell you you are amazing <laughs> and you were okay then and you are okay there now okay Evan you are a part of a blended family what are your current relationships with your family members now and why yeah um so um my dad passed away when I was seven years old almost eight 
my mom, we were already in the movement, but my mom had been, we had been living in South Carolina and Jack Kyles came down there and encouraged my mom to come back to his fold in Indiana. So we moved back up north and, and then a year later, he just kind of gently or whatever suggested she marry a man. And so I wouldn't call it an arranged marriage. I do think that my mom and stepdad, you know, want it to be together. Um, but there was a lot of that. If, if Jack Kyles had said you shouldn't be together, they absolutely would not have married. Kind of like It was that. So a suggested could, marriage. It's a suggested <laughs> marriage. And, and, and in their case, I think it worked out for them because they seem to have some of the same goals. But, um, but that was, you always had to get permission <clears throat> if you were going to marry someone. So in their case, you know, they worked out. So there were three, I have two blood siblings. So there are three of us. And then um, there were four step siblings. And I was 10 when they got married. So we, um, I mean, I'm very grateful for my step siblings today, at least most of them, because I'm still, I'm very, very close to my stepsister. She left a few years before me. She was actually the very first one in our group to fully mm. leave. She took off, she was 19. She literally ran away in the middle of the night and you know, she's never looked back. Um, my step, I have a stepbrother who I am also close to now. He had a rocky go of things, but he's doing okay now. And I'm actually going to be a groomsman in his wedding in a couple awesome. months. Um, yeah. And then my baby sister got out about two years ago. She's doing really good. You know, she's struggling. She's still new because it takes a couple years to really get your feet wet. She's doing good. And then I've got a couple siblings. I've got a uh, sister who's still very heavy into it. I don't talk to her. Um, she was a missionary for a long time, but they, she was in China. They shut down, they shut the borders. Um, mm -hmm. my, I have a sister who's disabled, who I love, but <clears throat> I don't get to, to talk to because she lives with my mom and stepdad. Mm -hmm. And I have a brother who's kind of like in and out and he's doing his own thing, but I do talk to him. Um, my mom and stepdad, I don't really talk to. I don't talk to my stepdad at all. I talk to my mom. We have kind of like one of those, like, um, I'll call you on your birthday and Christmas mm -hmm. kind of relationships. Yeah, like that kind of the yeah. token phone calls. Yeah, exactly. That's yeah. difficult. Uh, actually, Autumn, he answered my next question, so I'm going to have you skip up to number eight. But, Evan, I don't want you to answer the question until part two because we're down here on our minutes. So I am going to go ahead and have you ask number eight, and then I will switch over to part two. Okay, and I want to say something about parents, and we'll get to the other one. I'm going to pull my box out again. Oh, well, let me see. Go ahead and say it. We got six minutes, so I think okay. if you don't go, too, if you don't ramble too long, we'll have we'll have time for it at the end of this one. So go ahead and you do your you do your thing, girl. You okay. do you. <laughs> let Let me explain this. Um, my my parents stayed in after I left. My parents stayed in. It was the most heartbreaking, heart wrenching thing for me, because I didn't have parents to turn to. Thankfully, my father would come and talk to me anyway. He didn't care. And, and my mother would try, but you could tell that it hurt her as much as it hurt me because I wasn't in the beliefs. And, and one thing I really, really, really want to convey to parents that are out there, whether your child is in the cult and you're not in the cult or you're in the cult and your child is left, you gave birth to that child. That child is bonded with you for life, not until they're 18, but for life. Never let anybody ever break that bond of love that needs to be there. A child needs a parent until there's no more breath in that child. And a parent needs their child too. Goes yes. both ways. I, I am a mother of three and a grandmother of two and my life would be destroyed without my children. You know, my children call me a stalker. I don't care, maybe I am. <laughs> All right, Evan, the question we are going to ask is, do you have any positive memories from your experience that you would like to share. We will get that answer from you in part two. Stay tuned. There's a lot more to this story. We'll be right back. Don't miss it. <laughs> 